My name is Josh Levine. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for the invite to speak here. Um, I'm the owner of the Force Academy, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about sports performance for lacrosse. My goal is to give you guys, not get all the way into the weeds, but give you kind of a top level view of some principles that you can then take, and as you're evaluating your off season programming, what you're doing in season, um, as you're looking at that, just go, okay, if can I read the language here? You don't need to be able to write it, right, so to speak, or speak it, but can I read it and look at a training session and go, I think that makes sense for my team, or uh, maybe I need to have a conversation with how we're structuring this. Uh, before I do that, I'll give you a little background on myself and Fortis, and then we'll, we'll get into these different principles about building strength and speed and how you do that effectively, just macro principles. We won't get, like I said, we won't get into the weeds. Um, so, my name is Josh Levine. I grew up here in Bloomington, Minnesota. Like Katie said, I went to Ridgeview Elementary uh, with, with her. Uh, played hockey, that was my main sport, but also ran 100 meters and track through high school. Did soccer, golf, baseball, love multi-sport. I think it's a really important thing to do. Um, I graduated from Jefferson in 2007 and then went and played a year of hockey in the USHL. So, in the hockey world, you have to do that before you go to college. And that was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Then went to Princeton University, got a degree in International and Public Affairs, New Eastern Studies, which prepared me for this talk today. Uh, worked, uh, used that degree in a sense, uh, worked for the federal government for four years out in Washington, DC. And then my wife and I had our first child, Eliana. We have three, I've got an eight-year-old girl, Ellie, a six-year-old boy, Joel, and then a three-year-old girl, Genevieve. She's a stage five clinger, so if there's any parents in here that have advice, we're working on it, separating the little one from mama bear usually. Um, and I wrote a book called Save Our Game. It's uh, more of a hockey tilt to it, but if you literally you know, find replaced hockey with lacrosse, uh, it's all about long-term athletic development principles, what makes the most sense for how to develop athletes, and how are we structuring sport, right? And hockey does a lot of things, unfortunately, in a way that limits the pyramid, less kids can play, and aren't adhering to long-term athletic development principles. So that's what that, that book is about. And that's a brief background on, on myself. I live here in Eden Prairie and uh, yeah, have the three kids. Just got a dog, Bernie Doodle. Uh, this is the rest of our staff. I'll go over really briefly Fortis in general. Uh, Coach Adam Vidovnik's here. He's one of our strength coaches. Also does lacrosse uh, training. Uh, highlight just a couple other ones really quickly. Uh, Stephanie Cassette's our operations manager, so we do a leadership program, which I will detail just very briefly. Um, and she helps set up everything. So if we were gonna do a leadership program with a team or with an association, she'll get the room, all the logistics, communications. And then uh, I introduced Adam, and then on the bottom left is Beja Drilling. She's a sports dietitian. She's also one of our strength coaches. So she's always in the gym, so we can infuse that into our sports performance training. I'll give you a very brief overview of what Fortis is. We do a lot. It, you can think of us most broadly as a holistic sports performance training company that does anything underneath that umbrella pretty much now. Okay, so we have two gyms, one off 169 in Valley View, which is on the border of Eden Prairie and Edina. If you know where the Edina Ice Rink is, it's on the west side of 169 there, just across from it basically. Our other gym is off 66th in Portland in Richfield. We do training with teams, associations, individuals, semi, you know, private, small group, et cetera. We do sports specific skill work and hockey, lacrosse, and soccer. Mainly in hockey, because that's kind of my background, but we're increasingly doing a little bit more in the lacrosse and in the soccer space. We'll do nutrition seminars. Uh, so Beja, we'll do, a lot of times they'll do them on Zoom, especially if it's in season. So she, she's done them with the Dinah girls hockey team. Uh, where she'll zoom in and go do a 30 minute talk on nutrition with the team, maybe after practice. We do a leadership program. If we get time, I'll go over that in you know, a couple minute overview uh, in a little bit here. A couple other things we do, we do sports day camps. So on Monday, we're gonna have 75 uh, second through eighth graders coming to Champions Hall to play games all day. And that fits our philosophy of what we're trying to do is have kids just doing a lot of activity and getting off these. And so in, on their school days off, we have that. We partner with associations where we'll send it out to, you know, uh, Minneapolis United is a soccer club we work with. So they'll send it out to all their second through eighth graders and they can come on over and we play sports literally all day. And the kids, I, I, the thing I love about those and why I'm highlighting it a little bit is because they train for six hours and then mom and dad or whoever comes to pick them up and they wanna keep training. 
in quotes, right? Like they play handball, they play soccer, they play football, they play floor hockey, they play Newcomb, they, you name it, they play it. Wall ball, a lot of good hand-eye coordination games, tag games, relay tag, six hours of it. I, I don't think we're gonna be able to overcome the play deficit unless we be a little bit more intentional about it and help set, it, set that up for parents. And a lot of you guys are seeing some of the consequences of that deficit when you get kids at the high school level. Talk about that a little bit on the leadership side. Last two things we do that I think would be of interest to you guys, we go into associations and we can kind of be an outside voice. And we can come in and say, okay, here's the science behind long-term athletic development principles. Do we really want to focus on only the top four 10U players? No, here's why. Let's look at some maturation curves. Let's look at genetics and sports performance, how that influences things. Okay, do we have some issues with maybe educating parents on some of these principles? We'll come in, I do that parent seminar. Um, after it, we have a ton of really great testimonial feedback because what we're trying to do is get in front of parents before the myths get so entrenched. I kind of compare it to like zombies. I think once they're infected, I don't know if we have an antidote. Like it might, you, it, don't try too hard and waste like, just have family dinner. Um, but if we can get it in front of them when they're six to eight, you know, they have kids from five to 10 maybe, far more likely to show them what the science is and then just have them relax and go, okay, yes, Joey is a very good lacrosse player in third grade. I have no idea what that means. No one else does. Anyone that tells me differently is probably asking for a check. Oh, they are asking for a check. Okay, yep, Josh told me that. Um, so just be careful about how that looks, right? Um, and then the last thing is recruitment and retention, growing the game. And we're increasingly doing this. Uh, I'll give you a hockey example, but we're looking to do this in lacrosse and all sports. And hockey, Richfield Youth Hockey has not been around for about eight years, okay? And in the hockey world, maybe similar to lacrosse, people are basically saying, well, demographically, you know, it's just not the same. You know, there's kids that they don't want to play hockey. So this last year we said, okay, let's test that theory. Uh, we have 55 kids registered. Okay, 25 of them in the Richfield School District, about another 25 in the Minneapolis, and then a few kids from sprinkled all over, like East Bloomington and stuff. Um, th literally people saying there's just no one there. And that's one year of us putting a little bit of effort in terms of recruiting and finding kids and going out to community ed and doing all that. So we partner with associations that need help with that. And then we'll go out and we'll, we'll facilitate some of those partnerships. We'll get to community ed, we'll go to Parks and Rec, uh, we'll print flyers. We have a very good, um, Beja is also like our graphic designer basically. And we can put, we have a professional account. We can put together flyers and yard signs and then we'll get them out in the community for you and help get as many kids playing lacrosse as possible or any other sport. Because for us, that's really important. What we're seeing now, I think you all know, is there's a lot of kids quitting after 12. There's also just not a lot of kids getting into sport um, in part because we're just making it so hard to play. Um, I've got three kids. I'm, I'm a hockey person. My wife could care less about hockey. Um, and when we looked at a lot of the travel programming for like our second grade daughter, we just kind of thought, well, how are we going to do this? Right? It's at different days, different times, every weekend, all this travel. So we've, we've been able to do this Saturday, Sunday Richfield thing with them once in a while because it's consistent days, consistent times. And guess what? 25 sessions, 100 bucks. Because we have nonprofit par partners that come in and make this affordable and help, help cover coaching, marketing costs, T-shirts, pins. The kids get the whole nine yards. So I really wanted to highlight that one because it's a, it's a near and dear to our hearts at Fortis is just getting more kids playing sport, and I have heard, even in the lacrosse world, of a couple places where people are saying, well, there's just not kids that'll play lacrosse there. I'm like, you don't have to rent a rink. This is so much easier. Like, you just need a field. There's, we can definitely find kids. It's easier to do it in lacrosse than it is hockey. Uh, that's for sure. So, something to think about. Okay, with that, I'll just get right into the talk. Again, the goal for this is for you to be able to take some of these nuggets, uh, these principles, if you will, and then look at off-season programming that you have, and then even your own in-season training. Uh, obviously, most of your training is just 99% of it would be just technical skills, team training, but like, what's a way that maybe you can infuse sports performance principles into that to help ensure that your kids are the most explosive they can be at the end of the season, the most powerful and strong, et cetera. So, we're gonna go through speed or strength, speed. We're gonna talk about uh, sports specific considerations. I'm also gonna give you some considerations for like just working with high school athletes, um, especially with Instagram, unfortunately. You know, a high school kid might get this like impression that they should be training like Tom Brady, which is fine if you have millions of dollars and 
you know, it's like, do you really need the deep tissue massage? Like you turn sideways and I can't see you. So what are they massaging? Like your rib bone? Like maybe just get in the gym first, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then if we have time, we'll go into the cultural building aspect and what I see, per, just like my insights from, I've been doing this for about 20 years. And we'll talk about, okay, a team comes in, what do you see in the off season? And I'll tell you, that tells you what's going to happen in season. Like it's like a one-to-one -one correlation and I'll go over a few examples. So those are some things that you guys can be thinking about if you hear some things that are going on with your off-season programming and whatnot. Uh, there's signs that will tell you what's gonna happen in season. The die has been cast, you've crossed the Rubicon when the season starts, so to speak, right? Um, okay, so training for strength. You hear this one all the time. And, and on, you know, sports performance training, and I think just similarly to lacrosse or hockey or any other sport, it's really not rocket science. Right, it's kind of relatively simple. So a lot of times coaches will tell players, hey, get stronger, like we, we need you to get stronger. One thing to consider is strength is not, there's no one definition of strength. And that's probably the biggest thing that gets confused because then everyone has different ways they're kind of thinking of it. And then that manifests differently in terms of what they're doing in terms of their training. And so strength is the production of force at a given velocity. And that's the big thing to be thinking of. How much force are you producing and at what velocity? So someone lifting a 500 pound boulder very, very slowly and then getting it on top of a ledge is producing a lot of force, but at a very incredibly slow velocity, right? Someone jumping up in the air with a cross stick and whipping their core and their hips around and firing a ball at 100 miles an hour, that person is using a very different velocity to exert force. If you train to lift the big boulder, you're not doing anything to help with shooting the lacrosse ball. And the biggest mistake I tend to see, and it tends to be in like the high school uh, weight room sort of setting uh, within high school strength and conditioning programs, is that that sort of legacy of football, and I don't even think this is optimal for football, but sort of back squat, hang clean, you know, just sort of the power lifting type stuff, uh, that tends to be just everyone does it. And it's kind of the thing you do. Like, we just want to lift as much weight as we possibly can. And you're like, well, yeah, but last time you did three rep max on the back squat, three guys blew out their low backs. Does this, you know, like, the best players are the ones that are playing, not on the sidelines. So should, maybe we rethink that just a little bit. Um, so as you're looking, excuse me, as you're looking at programming, if you don't see things that are also matching the velocity of the game, like if it's all just slow, and just trying to lift heavy and just let's get gains in the weight room, I'm not sure that's the best thing to translate into lacrosse or really any sport. One caveat, which I'll get into a little bit later, is let's say you have a ninth grade boy, you could put him in Zumba class and he'll probably get stronger and he'll get better at lacrosse, right? There's not a whole lot there. He hasn't trained very much. So I'm not saying this has to be a fire sale either. Like at the very beginning when kids are training, if they have like a zero to six month training age, which means they've barely been training, maybe they went to lifetime a few times with mom or dad or something like that, anything is going to be beneficial. So if you have nothing, just something is better than nothing, right? And that will be, that will help your, your program a lot. Once you start getting into the, you know, you guys have been, the kids have been training a little bit, you wanna make it obviously a little bit more specific there. And velocity specific is important. Like things should be done, uh, fast, which means we, we'll talk about it when we get to speed, but sprints, jumps, etc. right? And then when we're lifting, instead of lifting maybe 500 pounds really slow, we might want to be doing more like 200 pounds with a little bit of concentric force. So as they're coming up, they're doing it with some speed. The second thing to think about <clears throat> is joint angle specificity. And so basically just what joint angles are different movements being done on the field. And then are we put working on those in the gym or in the, on the turf, et cetera, right? Um, I'll give you like the biggest, the easiest example if we just contrast hockey and lacrosse. So if I'm doing a squat jump, very simple exercise, and they're good for both, for the hockey player, they have to get into a low joint angle. They have to be like this. A lacrosse player is gonna be a little higher up, and that's fine. I mean, they can get lower too. If you go lower and you get all the way through that range of motion, it's fine. But I wouldn't want a lacrosse player jumping from here necessarily, right? Like generally I'm gonna have them more into that specific joint angle that they have in lacrosse. And then what I'm looking for from my, my program is I wanna see the gains. I wanna, like if I'm talking to whoever is running it or whatever, I want them thinking about the gains being transferred to the field, not the weight room. And you see this all the time where it's like, oh, well our bench press is going up. It's like, okay, and I, you know, I'm not an expert in lacrosse, tr lacrosse, but it's an evasion-based sport, 
which means you don't want the other team to get the object, which means it sort of replicates like hockey and basketball and all these other sports in terms of general broad level tactics. Keep the ball, don't let the other group get it. I'm guessing speed's like really important. And I'm guessing if we took every team in the state and tested their 20 yard dash, we could probably with like 70% accuracy determine who wins the game, right? It's probably a pretty high correlation, just looking at speed. I know in the hockey world, it's pretty good correlation, okay? Um, and in, in, with all the lacrosse players that we've tested in our gym, I can basically just watch them sprint, look at the number, and then go, okay. Like, that's, a, that's I mean, unless they're just, their hands are, you know, brutal. They're, they're probably on varsity, or they're probably on JV, or here's where they, they tend to stand. So, I think as much as you can, thinking about those gains for the, for the, for the field. Now, what happens here then, and I don't know the extent to which this happens in the lacrosse world, it definitely happens in hockey and some other sports as well, is we go, okay, well, we want it to be lacrosse specific. So the, there's the one extreme, which is where it's like basically legacy football training, and then the other extreme where it's like, okay, yeah, it's super lacrosse specific. They're like, they're, you know, he's got one hand with his lacrosse stick and he's doing a bicep curl in the other. See, it, we're, we do training for lacrosse. It's not for the, all those other sports. They're so different. Um, and I think, I think there's actually a little bit of a danger in that that I want you guys to be uh, thinking about. So first, what would the difference be between training for lacrosse, and let's just take another sport like uh, football or soccer? Okay, let's just go through a couple attributes. So do you wanna be fast in soccer or would it be better to be slow? No, we wanna be fast. Okay, how would you get them fast? We would sprint, okay. Would you do that in lacrosse? Yes, okay. So where are the differences then between the lacrosse training and the soccer training? And I'll give you a couple examples on how that looks, but generally if someone's talking to you as if it's like a whole different program, like there's, there's no overlap, it, that's just marketing, which is fine, but just know that it's not, there, there shouldn't be, the lacrosse program and the soccer program and the hockey program shouldn't be so different that they're like 95% different. They may be more like 80%. And how are they different? Focus. Uh, the easy, ex easiest example for me would be, let's compare baseball, hockey, and lacrosse. So baseball, main injuries, shoulder, so rotator cuff, serratus anterior work, scapular sta stabilization. That means when we get to prehab, which we'll talk about, we do it every day in our programming, we're going to emphasize shoulder prehab over hip and hamstring and knee, just because that's where they're still going to do all of that, but more of the focus will be on the shoulders. Uh, you know, baseball, they don't really move that much. So... Uh, they, their core rotation is important, so that's going to be a little bit more emphasized than maybe even like a lacrosse program, right? They're not, they don't have to take the same beating and don't have the same type of strength. Um, so you can think of that difference in focus, right? Or then like hockey and lacrosse, or like, let's take lacrosse now, what would be the main, some of the main injury points? Like knees, ACLs we want to worry about, especially with females, we want to worry about ACL risk. What does that mean? That means we need to fire up the posterior, hamstrings, and glutes. When those get weak, we get quad dominant, and then we get issues at the knee. And so any good sports performance program should be factoring in the fact that not just, not just the sport, but also the gender too, and then a little bit on the age, okay? If you do that programming really well, you can still, someone can still blow out an ACL. It's just the way it works. Um, but we do know that if they're glute to ham, so glutes and hamstrings relative to quad ratio is strong so that the back is not so much weaker than the front and that when they land, like they do a squat jump and when they land, if they don't land like this, they land nice and properly, they have good mechanics, so the knees over the ankles, over the hips, we have reduced the risk of that injury. Now, can the performance program be too specific? Yes, I think so. So I want you to imagine, right, um, if I said, I'm gonna make a hypothetical situation that's rather absurd, but it'll highlight the point, I think the easiest. Okay, we run a, let's say, I'm, this is not actually us, but okay, we're gonna do a lacrosse specific program. Core rotation's really important. We want, the, we want them to shoot harder. And so we're gonna have them come in and we're gonna have them take the cable machine and just crank a thousand out each side because it's sport specific. And then they're gonna go to you on the field and they're gonna do this a lot, right? Because we're trying to train lacrosse. What do you think's gonna happen? injury, right? Now all you're doing is the same movement in the sport in the gym, and that does not make any sense. The gym is, does two things, I think, more broadly philosophically. One, it complements the attributes that you need in the sport, so it's going to make you faster, more explosive, stronger in a sport-specific way. 
okay? And then two, it counteracts the stimulus, the, re the, the degradation in the system, the body system, from the same stimulus happening over and over and over and over again. So in lacrosse, you might start to get a little quad dominance. So when we come into the gym, we wanna fire up the hips. We wanna get the glute, and we wanna get the hamstrings going. We wanna do some things that are just gonna look very different. You rotate a lot in lacrosse. And I see a lot of times the low back, you kind of get like, they, they like when I shoot, I get a little bit of a pinch or I, I'm feeling like a little bit of a pain in my low back. That's most likely from a lack of Trump's trunk stabilization and anti-rotation ability. So instead of doing this a thousand times, we just need the ability to hold and keep everything tight with resistance maybe against the cable but not necessarily always cranking on rotation. We need to do anti-rotation and rotation. So think of it too as that, you want the, you want the weight room to, to counteract the stimulus that you get from the field so that uh, you, your kids can reduce injury risk. And if you think of like the number one thing, I was just meeting with one of the strength coaches with the Blackhawks, so I'm like, what's the number one influence we can have, especially at that level? And it's like injury reduction. If your best player's hurt, that, right, they can't play. And they cannot, again, there's some things you just can't do. Sometimes it's just like, ah, they step, ACL goes. I've had athletes that have had that happen to them. But hopefully over time, from an average level, we get enough of them doing the right training and we reduce the risk of that. And then over time, we have fewer of those incidences happening. Okay, training for speed. I love this one. This is like one of our favorite things to do. So I'm gonna go over a bunch of different ways that we uh, that we do this. First, how do we define speed? What does that even, what's that mean? Because you see this all the time too where there's such different concepts of speed. Because I've seen it where like, and I'll pick on football since hopefully no one's a football coach here. Uh, you know, they'll be like, yeah, we're trying to get faster. And then I'm like, okay, what are you doing? And we're, we're running them down and back a thousand times. I'm like, well, that's not gonna get them faster. Um, and also, it seems like your sport's relatively short bursts of energy, so I don't, I don't quite understand. Why are we doing that? Um, so speed, there's two, thing, two main ways I think of it, right? So you have top speed or top velocity, which is as they get up to full speed, where are they at? And then you have their acceleration capability, okay? So getting from zero to full speed. And how long does that take them? Can they get to that really quickly? Um, I'm guessing acceleration is probably, for most of the players on the field, the number one thing. For those that are going up and down, this, doing 70 yards, sure, getting up to top speed is really important, but a lot of, a lot of uh, players, if they're not holding onto the ball for more than three seconds, they'd have to be more than three seconds, probably linearly, before they're gonna hit full speed. Two to four seconds. Maybe at the elite level they can hit it by two and a half, okay? But they're gonna need some time before they hit, hit full speed. So acceleration is really important. So we have the acceleration, and then we have top speed. You'll notice there's two different general, I'm like really simplifying this, but there's like maybe like let's say two different body types that manifest in two different types of speed. Short legs like mine tend to be better at acceleration and they're top speed so they get up really fast and then you know the gazelle catches and then you've got the tall ones with the really long legs who if they're pretty athletic you're like ah their first three steps slow once they get up to full speed they're like flying. Um, and that's just nice to know because then you can look at that and go, okay, well, what emphasis do they need to be working on? The one that has the shorter legs, maybe we want to get them up to full speed a little bit more, do like accelerators and buildups. The one that with the longer legs, uh, we definitely need to be working on vertical jump and just explosive power to get them a little quicker on their first three steps. Um, ways, ways to improve this. I think it's actually relatively simple. If your programs, sprints are like the number one thing, in my opinion, for improving speed, it's I know, and it's stupid simple. They need to be short, and then you need to have a lot of rest in between them. And that's the biggest mistake I see all the time. It's like, oh yeah, we did 80 yard sprints. I'm like, okay, uh, that, that's fine, but if you're doing a lot of them and then have almost no rest, like it's gonna take them a very long time to recover. And then what's going to happen is that they're gonna subconsciously not sprint at max intent. And so they've, they've done some tests on the, on the bicycle, Wingate bicycling tests, where they'll say, okay, sprint for 30 seconds. No one actually gets to top velocity. Sprint for 10, they get to top velocity because they know I get up to it, I'm going to hold it for three seconds, and then I'm going to start imperceptibly slowing down, but I can do that. But if you tell me to go for 30, I'm not, gonna, I'm not cranking 100%. I'm, try, I'm going at like 98 the whole time because I have to reserve a little bit of energy to be able to sprint that whole time. So short sprints with a good amount of rest and just making sure they're fast. Sometimes I think for coaches, it's like, well, that's soft. It's just not, that's not that hard. It's a different hard. The hard is the mental part 
Like it's really hard to get a group of athletes to actually sprint 100%. 98% is easy. But to go to the point where they're just past their comfort zone and actually getting one hundredth of a second faster that day, that is hard. So one thing we do, and I have a picture of it, these uh, lasers, we use these lasers uh, use weekly or every two weeks, and we test the athletes on them. And then what, what's nice about this is it's one at a time, they test, and we yell out their score. And so, you know, now everyone knows how you're run. like everyone goes hard when they have that at the end of the day, you have to hear what your score was. And they kind of get a little addicted to it, so it gamifies it. So it's been a really fun way for us. We started doing this about two years ago where every sprint, if possible, is always done on the laser. We set the lasers up over at our facility. If, as long as we have that corner of turf, we want you sprinting and we want to be able to test you. And if you get a PR that day or whatever your best score is for the day, we input into our chart. Um, and what we found is over time when we started doing that, the, the, our test results got so much better very quickly. Um, we'd have off days, some days someone's tired or whatever, but over time you start to see those test scores coming, coming down. What distance are you doing on that? 20 yards. Yep, so there's, I wanna go more than 20, but by the time they get to 20, they're pretty much pretty close to full speed. So an, an elite varsity athlete's gonna be somewhere around 2.5 seconds. This is with a foot start, you can also do flies. Um, and you know, the slower athletes are gonna be, and this is for males, I would say males are around 2.5 to 2.7. Uh, females, I think the fastest I have recorded would be Mary Vellner from Edina. Uh, like fast, faster than a lot of her boys. She was in the two sixes, but I would say really fast girls are generally in the two sevens uh, to the like three mark. But I, at the high school level, I'd want them if they sprint three, I'm like, okay, let's get that into the twos. We want two nine or, or, or better. A couple other ways that we like to improve on speed and acceleration is resisted sprints. So you can think of a sprint uh, like a push-up, right? So it's just a body weight bench press. The push-up's a body weight bench, and so then we also wanna do bench where we load. And so same thing with sprints. So we use acceleration uh, trainers where we hold someone back and then let go. So it creates that overspeed effect. We use sleds. I think those are really great. I mean, if you had, in a perfect world, you'd have those out at practice a couple days a week just to prime the pump. Um, and we, both of those, this is the acceleration trainer. You can see me stopping AJ from sprinting really fast and he's just driving his knees hard. I, now he's trying to overcome greater resistance. I let go with one hand, all that resistance goes away and then he flies out. Um, I'm just gonna give you guys a few ideas, but for in-season stuff, how cool would it be once a week when you have a few days off before the next game maybe or a couple days? I know your guys' season is short, but just, working on priming the fast twitch pump, if you will. A lot of times, that's the biggest thing that diminishes over time throughout a season. Uh, at best, most teams might have a little bit of strength training. And again, I know you're, you, lacrosse is unique because it's so condensed. And so you have so much going on in like a really short window. But hey, could you maybe on the field do acceleration? Those are $50 a pop. Could you do like six of those once a week just to get everyone firing at max intent? Because think about it too, like in a practice, how often do they actually get to their max velocity? And how often are they, right? Like, I don't know, yeah. I just have a quick question. If a coach blasts those, mm -hmm. is there any way a coach could do it wrong and injure the kids, or can we just buy those and? I think it'd be pretty hard to injure them. Um, so uh, we'd be more than happy to like send you a video of how to do it if you just shoot me a note too. Like you could buy those, they come in little black bags, like they're pretty storable too. And then, um, the, we usually have our athletes holding the other athlete. So the, the biggest thing is educating the athlete on like how it should look, because the, the acceleration sprint, so if you use a sled too, you could also do sleds. And if you have like a shed over by the field, you could buy the sleds, they're about $100, and then you can get, it's a little bit more expensive, you can get some bumper plates. For uh, females, I would do like 25 to 35 pounds a sled. For males, I would probably do 35 to 45 pounds. And then all they're doing is the, it connects to the sled, and then they're just gonna, we literally just do get up to full speed. So three second sprints. Just three seconds, slow down. Catch your breath, three seconds, slow down. Do six of those, five of those before practice like kicks off, and you're priming that fast twitch pump. Um, and you'd probably be one of the only sports at the high school level in the state or country that's actually like doing something like that. It takes some intention, et cetera. But when you're doing both of those, what you should see is you should still see the athlete kind of moving nicely through it. So if you see them like, it's like a, almost like an EKG in terms of their speed, like they're kind of going fast and then the person's like really holding, you know, it should be nice and smooth and then let go. 
And so I, I look for the, whether it's the sled sprint or the acceleration trainer, I want it to be like this space. I want to see them, they're sprinting at a, like a fast walk, okay, or even a light jog, and then we're releasing versus like just stand still. And sometimes with that, if you're athletes, like we sometimes have to be like, okay, come on, you're, you're, you're just really trying to tug on the kid, right? Um, I think at the high school it would be easier. A lot of times that'd be more like an eighth or ninth grade boy that would be doing that. Um, so that's a good question. So one thing to think about as you're, as you're looking at maintaining speed in season, uh, it definitely goes down more than anything else. Uh, might as well mention it too, while you're, if you're looking at maintaining strength during the season, that's actually not that difficult either. Like just to put a little something in, like what if the kids just went in the weight room and did three exercises, lower body, upper body, core, just working on strength, five reps, nothing crazy, don't, don't get them tired, don't do circuits, don't do 30 seconds on, 30, no, nothing like that, because that's just volume. They don't need volume. You guys got more volume than you know how to handle. But if they just went in and did three sets of five on strength to stave off a lot of the diminishing strength that they have throughout the season, that'd be huge. Obviously, in college, this gets so much easier. In high school, you guys are just boxed in because they have school all day, they have stressors in life, family life, school life, then they come to you. So you're pro it'd be really, it's really hard to main, just even maintain throughout a season. Josh? Yeah. So if you had three exercises, my mind unfortunately goes directly to, okay, you're going to do squat, deadlift, and bench. Do you have three exercises? So that seems to contradict what you would have them do. So if you had three exercises you're going to do once a week, what would you do? Yep, great, great. I would do, uh, for upper body, I would do bench press. That's a great one. Upper body, I like more bilaterally. Uh, that works well because you can load a little bit more um, and the risk of injury is less than with lower body. With lower body, I would go unilaterally. So, and th the nice thing about that is you can get more, like squat racks, I mean, unless you guys have the dollars around here, I mean, these, this weight room's insane. Um, uh, it's really hard just logistically to get a lot of guys doing squats. And then for me, I personally don't feel comfortable unless I have one trainer to maybe like five athletes doing back squat just because of the risk of them doing it wrong. So I love single legs. So you can just imagine, instead of having to squat 135 pounds, I can hold 25s to 35s in my hands, step back into a lunge, come back up, five reps each leg. The risk of injury, very low. I mean, uh, I have so many of my athletes that have come back from college who have done like heavy back squatting and then had back issues. We have not had anyone have a back issue um, so far while doing like a lunge. Like a lot of times it's them doing the back squat and then they come up and they go, oh, that really hurt. I can barely walk now. That doesn't happen with, because you can imagine, we don't have to load on the back. We can hold here. And even our strongest athletes, like our strongest college men, get up to like 200 to 250 pounds on one leg. Start thinking about the fact that they all, then they have the rest of their body is being lifted by that leg versus bilaterally when they split the rest of their body to lift. And you go, wow, they actually are doing like, that's like the equivalent. You try a 200 pound single, no, actually don't. You'd get hurt. Um, but it's really hard. I, I know I can't personally do it. And it's basically like doing a 400 pound bilateral squat without the risk profile. And in the high school level, like when you want to you get 20 guys through it, how much easier is it 25 pound dumbbells? Even if you need to invest a little money into it, one squat rack would get you all the dumbbells you would need in order to do that. So you have bench press, barbell or dumbbell. Uh, both are good. I like, yeah, uh, barbell, uh, barbell bench and then single legs lunge, one a type of lunge variation. Uh, they'll be very, very sore after doing that, which will also give you a little bit of like a haha -ha moment because just doing a single leg, it requires more stabilization in the groin and in the hip. And so a lot of times the uh, athletes will come into our gym and they just do like 10 lunges and they're like, oh, I'm so sore. I'm like, oh yeah, you told me you were lifting um, at lifetime. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you were. Uh, yeah, I, I like a step back lunge just because that's going to fire the glute better than a forward lunge, right? Where it's going to hit the thigh. And generally, I think we're, so if you just step back, hit the glute, come up, fire through the glute and the hamstring, really focus on that. I think that's good. And then the last one uh, would be a dead bug. I won't demonstrate it, but you can just Google it online. You can do a million different variations. Why is that so good? Because then the core is stabilized, the low back is flat, and we're doing that anti rotation stabilization work which I think will reduce risk of injury, especially with all the torque. There's so much torque in lacrosse where they're coming across or even when you're hitting someone, that's a lot of stress on the low joint or the low back joint. Uh, what would you suggest then if we were to do like an on-field body weight or like a band workout instead of trying to get the weight? 
Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, push-ups would be easy for the bench press. You can push-ups like a regular push-up is 70% body weight. So like you can start looking at your kids and going, okay, well, if that kid's, you know, 200 pounds, can they bench? Like a lot of high school males won't even be able to bench their body weight. So, okay. 140 pounds, 10 times, like that might be really difficult for them. Uh, on the bench press, right? Now, when you're doing a push-up, you have a little bit more stabilization points, so it gets a little easier. But you could do that. I would do, for upper body, I would do um, uh, push-ups. And then it, on the field, you guys can get, and again, some of this you might need to email us just to get, I can send you this, but you could get uh, tubing. There, I like TheraBand tubing. You can also just get mini bands, you know, online. And then you can do some simple exercises like a lateral band walk. This actually, if you're going, everyone should be doing anyways, um, you put it around your feet, you know, you just do this band walk. And it looks super simple, but what we're doing is we're firing the glutes and letting the thighs kind of shut off. Um, any of your athletes that have had surgeries or whatever, they always come to us and they're like, oh yeah, we just, I, my PT is that. I'm like, yeah, you do band walks, you do hip clams, you do all of these exercises if you have a hip or a knee issue to recover. Uh, from that and to get those get the strength back and so I would do like a probably like a band walk or um, Some sort of donkey kick variation would be the more common name We call it quadruped leg extension a variation of it where they're just firing the glute with the uh, Firing their glute in their hips with the band and I think that would go a long way if you just did a couple of those um, uh, Throughout the year and that's actually a band walk that Maya she plays at Union is doing right there a lot of times then if you ask them where do you feel it? You'll be surprised. Like, just have them do it. Like, show them how to do it and then have them do it. And they'll be like, I feel it here. Ah, okay, so these aren't firing correctly yet. And that's just a brain thing. Like, so they'll, they, a lot of times they can be doing it correctly and they're still firing here. And you go, no, think here. And just a little bit of thought can neurologically help fire up the glutes better. And then dead bugs you can do on the field. There's tons of variations you could do on the field. Mm. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. How many of you have shin splints? I'm just curious. Is that a big one? Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. Yeah. I had shin splints when I did track and it was brutal. Um, uh, so the, the, the shin muscle is the tibialis anterior and, uh, the, well, one with reducing injury risk, if it's an acute injury, like the ankle gets broken, probably, yeah, I think maybe you could reduce that risk, but it's hard to tell. When we're talking about like a, a sprain or kind of like a, a more of an overuse injury, then we're trying to reduce risk there specifically because it's like, ah, they would have cut a little bit better with a stronger angle, ankle and then not have had that injury. Um, but so for the shin splints, it's the tibialis anterior. So within our programming, we do a lot of like uh, t like I think the, like the, some of the teams think we're, it's kind of weird, but you know, you get up on the uh, you're sitting down, you have a band around your foot, it's connected to our cage, and then you're just pulling that towards your shin 20 times like this, and you're just feeling the burn in that tibialis anterior. And I've actually had athletes the next day be like, text me, be like, I have, I think I have a shin splint. No, you don't. <laughs> that's from the, that's from, you're so sore from that exercise. So you were really at a high risk. Like if you went into the season and started running, and the other problem with lacrosse, as you guys know, is, I mean, we, we live in Minnesota, so then they go from like X volume of running to like Y, and that's, that's what's causing a lot of that high incidence in track and all the spring sports, because you're just, you're not using it at, at the, to the same extent. And it's hard for you guys, because then you also have this truncated season. So prior to that, to reduce the likelihood of it, is doing tibialis anterior work. So it's called, you know, you're just dorsiflexing. You're taking the shin and you're pulling it, or the toe, and you're pulling it towards the shin with a band. We'll even have our athletes put a kettlebell on their foot, and then they'll start doing this. Um, we'll also do heel walks. You'll see kids that have shin splints, they start doing this. The problem with the shin splint is once you have it, it's so hard to get rid of because there's such a lack of blood flow there. Um, once you have it, it's, it, it might be there till the season's over pretty much kind of feels like there's some recovery modalities I think you can do to help. But so think tibialis interior, you can look those up and that stuff you can even do on the field like this. Or if you guys bought bands, again, small stuff, you can take a long band. I can have my partner there. He holds it. I just do 20 quick, you know, and then I can even to get the ankle complex, I can then come on this side and I can go internal rotation on this ankle. 
I can do external rotation on the other ankle. I can flip around. So he's got the band there, right? It's going around my foot on this side. I can do external here and internal there. Do 20 minutes of pop. Just make it an ankle prehab circuit twice a week. Again, email me if you want me to. We can, Adam and I can just write some of this stuff out. We can even take videos of it for you. More than happy to do that. Um, I would love to know then, like, does it, how did it work? You know, like, did you see a reduction in ankle injuries and maybe report to us, like, how many you had and what types? That'd be really cool. Um, okay, we don't have too much time left, so I'll go quick on this. I think prehab in a strength training program is huge. We, at the end of our leg days, we generally do leg prehab, so hips, hamstrings, knees, working on that stuff. On the end of upper body days, a lot of times we'll do shoulder prehab, uh, so rotator cuff stuff. Uh, not as many injuries on your side there, and a lot of times those are gonna be acute injuries, like someone just gets hit really darn hard, uh, and so they're hard to prevent. But I do think there's actually some level of like, if you have really good shoulder stabilization back here, like your upper back strong, and again, especially for those of you that are working with male athletes, what do they do? Their chest gets really big, and then they do this, and then they wonder why when they get hit, like it's causing an issue. It's like, well, you, your shoulders are not meant to be like that. They're meant to be back. Um, so uh, something to think about there. Movement screens are some, that's like next level stuff where you come in and you basically, you can take a dynamometer or you can have all of your athletes jump and land, and then you can identify which one of them are going knee valgus, uh, which means their knees are caving in. This is something we're trying to figure out how to solve this riddle because it's like super time intensive and therefore it can cost a lot to implement. And parents, uh, we, we, we had a partnership with a PT outfit for a little bit prior to COVID and then that obviously COVID did its number on them. Um, but we, we found that parents, like it was really hard to communicate the education piece. It's like, no, you need, like, you need them coming in like at other times because we have to fix this. We have a high risk injury profile. And for whatever reason, I just think it was maybe on our end, we just weren't getting that communication across because it wasn't taken like, oh, like the, it, for us, it was like red flag, red flag. <laughs> we need them in here one-on-one -on -one to fix this. And I think parents just had a little bit of a tougher time seeing, like, I think maybe they just thought, nah, you're just trying to get them in more or something maybe with the PTs because they were supposed to go with the PTs. But that's something that if we can ever solve that riddle, we could really reduce injuries um, in, in the sport. And so something maybe as if some of you implement some of these prehab modalities, again, they're super simple, twice a week for like five minutes. And you can just tell your athletes like, hey, get out on the field, start warming up and get your, your in your warm up is gonna be band walks. It's just part of our dynamic warm up. Just get used to it. And now you're doing it, whatever, three, four days a week after practice. And that's not too much because you just do a round or two of it. Um, in, re in season recovery, I'm big on breath work and some yoga and re you know, stretching and stuff like that. Again, that's, that's something that if you can implement it, great. It's, it's time intensive, so it's also one of those things where it can cost a lot for a little bit, right? So some of it, if you can do it on your own. If you have any, if you want to talk about that, I want to move on, let me know. Um, I'm going to go quick here because I, I want to get to like questions and have a good amount of time for that. So I'm just going to finish up with a couple things. Windows of trainability. Some, some things to think about here. Let's look at males. So peak height velocity, PHF, is about 14 and a half. Females comes about two years prior to that. What typically happens with a ninth grade boy, this is, I'm gonna give you the story that I see a lot on the, on the boy's side here quick. The ninth grade boy comes into high school and he wants to lift like the senior captain. Okay, but you're here. You're here, you're in the speed window. Not, so the window of trainability is a time in which your body is most primed to develop a certain characteristic. And I would say from our testing, a lot of people, males, this, th this is when they're gonna get a really, like I would say, I would even shift it more, like 14 and a half to like 17, and then the gains start to slowly go down, but you can, we still get gains up until about like 20 to 21. And then we're basically just trying to return everyone to baseline when they come back from their seasons. Um, and then I think you could just generally f push that over with females about two years. Um, but with that with, uh, one caveat on the female side is we just haven't done a lot of testing for female athletes, and not us personally, but like the research world and strength and conditioning world. 
uh, has, is not anywhere near, I think, the amount of research on females as male athletes. So I think we're still trying to figure out how do we train them the best, and there's a lot to learn there. But this is just one thing to be thinking of as you have an athlete. If you look at them, and, uh, uh, you know, and you're like, okay, well, you look, th this can differ up to four years, by the way, too. So you can have a uh, 14 year old that comes in and looks like the senior captain and can go do the bench press with the senior captain and all the big weight lifts and get just as much out of it. And then you can have a 14 year old that could go in like the seventh grade classroom and no one says anything. So that's how physiologically they can differ so much. Um, but it's one thing to think about as even when you're talking to them, because I do see this a lot where a coach will say to the freshman, okay, you want to be on varsity next year as a sophomore, you need to get bigger, put on weight. And I'm looking at the kid like, yeah, but he has zero testosterone. That's going to be really hard to put on a lot of muscle. Like he may not be in that training window. And then there's a lot of pressure on the kid. And then I'm trying to educate the parents. Like, I know what the coach is saying. The coach wants you to get stronger, but if you just you don't want to have your goal somewhere where you're not going to be able to even go physiologically because you're not ready yet. And also, we don't want to lose the speed window. Okay, I'm going to do these last two slides and then we'll just go to questions because I do want to have time for that. Consistency over optimal program design. That's probably one of the biggest things. Like, if you can get the kids in two to three times a week, that gain is huge. If they're only coming in once a week, that's going to be really hard to get. So just try to get consistency over the exact optimal program. Um, I'm not a fan of the big back squat, whatever, but if you had this weight room here and you're like, that's just the best way for us to get consistency, then whatever, you just need consistency, um, especially at the high school level. Unilateral, uh, to me, is greater than bilateral because you have a lower injury uh, risk, you can load a lot of weight, you don't have to put it on the back, and logistically, it's easier, again, unlike, um, unless you have 30 squat racks, it's much easier to run, we have probably 10 single leg exercises that we use, and so we have a variation of 10 there with you know, a set of dumbbells that costs maybe the same as one squat rack. So logistically for us, and we only have so much room in our gym, et cetera, et cetera, so that's why we de default more to unilateral. Um, I think when you look at your program, sprints and jumps are just gonna be better for high school athletes than slow and heavy in general. Uh, do no harm is greater than just trying to make it hard. That's probably one of the biggest issues at the high school level and generally in high school gyms. It's like, oh, let's just lift really heavy and then someone blows a shoulder out or whatever. Don't like that. Like we want them to, to be playing. And then the last thing is team is greater than individuals doing their own thing. This is probably one of the biggest things I see uh, happening a lot of times is just the, this idea that, well, I've got this special thing going on over here. Like this is, that's, that's, that's what I've got going on. So uh, I'm going to go do that. Uh, you know, I'm, and a lot of times it's more like I'm too good to do the strength training with the team. I would say probably at least 50% of the time, that's probably them hiding. Like, oh yeah, I go to Lifetime and I, or whatever, some fancy place. And it's like, are you actually, like, then you end up, you know, I, you, I'll end up finding out or someone will, or I'm talking to a coach about a unique situation, not even involving us. And, and they're like, yeah, I talked to the trainer over there. That person's never showing up. Oh, because they're hiding. Yes, I get it. Um, sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's sometimes they are working really hard there, but more often than not, I, uh, I think they're actually a little bit trying to hide. I do want to give one example of the culture building and then ask and then open up for questions at the very end here. I think training together as a team consistently is probably the most beneficial way to build a team culture. I can't think of anything better working out day in, day out, together for an hour and making that sacrifice. I'm gonna highlight uh, really quickly the Benilde boys hockey team. Uh, different sport, I, I know. Um, well, even, even last year, you could say with the Benilde girls team, I mean, they were in just, it was like the numbers were the highest they've ever been. The consistency was the highest it's ever been. It felt good, leadership felt good. You look at it, you go, this looks good, okay? Uh, the Benilde boys hockey team, we do a lot with Benilde, but uh, the Benilde boys hockey team this year, for those of you, you're not hockey people, but basically they got decimated. All their studs left. So I want you to imagine your studs leave. All their, their best players leave. They've done better this year than anyone ever thought. They're top five in the state, better than they were last year, and all of their top players left. How was that possible? It was the fr I've been working with them for seven years. It was the first year, okay, and there was this symbiotic relationship with the coach that we really, Ken and I got together, we're like, we have to dial in. It was almost like once you feel a little pain, like you're like, oh, uh-oh, we don't have the top players now. Now we have to figure out how, how do we get these, these players up here. So we had them coming in the gym Monday through Friday, every day, if they didn't show up, the captains would text me who didn't show up. Coach Polly would get on them 
And then we tested them and instantly shared that with um, Coach Pauly, who then, if they were not working hard, had a conversation. It was so cool, the, the, what we saw from that. And now they're way overachieving where they've ever been. I'm gonna give you one other example. I was co coaching a team, this was about 15 years ago. I asked them to do a warm up. We were at a track and I said, okay, go run a lap and then we'll warm up right here. They started running within about 100 meters. They were into four separate groups. The top guys, kind of the juniors all together, the losers, you know, the goofballs. And they turned into four groups so fast. And I looked at it and I go, this isn't good. And then uh, they had one player that kept showing up. And whenever he showed up, we'd have a bad workout. And I couldn't figure, it took me about a month where I was like, why did, was today bad? Like, it just feels bad. It's that energy. You kind of feel it when you're in the gym. You're like, oh, this is... This doesn't feel right, like what's wrong? And then I noticed it was the same kid coming in. And I did tell the coach, I'm like, I would get rid of him. He was good enough to be on the team, I'm like get rid of that kid, like no way. Well, sure enough, he quit halfway through the season. They went 24 and 0 and then didn't win a championship. Did not get into the state. Again, it was like, I, we saw it from the beginning. Like all these guys ended up going playing pro and D1. I'm like, yeah, but they're not a team. <laughs> they're not gonna win. And so I can't wait to see, I mean, maybe the Benil boys might lose in the section quarterfinal game, the hockey team. But this year, they have a far better chance of actually winning when it counts because they're a team and they've just gone through it with each other. I've never seen that consistency for 10 weeks. So um, those are just some, some examples of stuff you see uh, with, We'll get going right to the questions. But those are some things that you see with teams when you have them, in, have them in the weight room. And that's one thing that we look for as trainers. We're just trying to like, okay, look at how the leadership's working, how hard are they working, and then communicate that as well to the coaches. So um, with that, I don't want to go over. So are there any questions? Mm. or games, is there like, I love that it, you do kind of just the three exercises, five minutes, is there like a three exercise, five minute situation, plus breathing, plus yoga, after specific cold, specifically like the cold rehab? Are, do you see a lot of issues with the cold on the, on the bodies, is that what you're thinking? I just think over time, they're not ever, I just think in general, they're not basically cooling down. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I, I'm not sure I know exactly. I think like, uh, I think generally it's the warm up side where I see it neglected the most. Yeah. And I think the cool down side, uh, I tend to more favor, like I'm fine with it being more, a little bit more at home. Yeah. Um, but I think maybe there's, maybe there's a, a space for a routine that your players have for when they get home yeah. for just some stretching. Cause it'd be hard to do it on the field when it's cold. Yeah. Maybe the warm-up, though, is maybe that's kind of something to key in a little bit more. I, I think so, and then I think at home it could be, like, a lot of times, you know, think about what stretch are they probably going to do? What, what muscle do you guarantee they're probably stretching? Quad. Quad, yeah, yeah, you, you have to make sure you're stretching the quad because that's where you get just so tight, and it's actually kind of hard to stretch it. I would say a lot of times they're definitely going to stretch the hamstrings. The yeah, they sit on the ground and do that, versus I would say a lot of times they don't, they might do this, but they don't have a great stretch for really firing the quad stretch for like a minute. And so that's something, that's another thing. If you guys shoot us a note, be more than happy to send maybe like a, we could put together like a Google Drive, five, five part at home stretch routine for some of your athletes that would try to get rid of some of those imbalances. A lot of times the athletes will overstretch their hamstrings and understretch the quad. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I love doing leadership and I love meeting with captains and sitting down with them and talking to them. You guys are in a very hard spot because you basically have athletes who have been um, uh, raised in a system to not teach them leadership. So my first recommendation would be to have your youth program start doing leadership training like ASAP. Um, uh, we run a program with youth, with youth associations that gives curriculum to the coaches 
and pins and a whole system. We spoon feed them and we go, we're gonna saturate this experience. So by the time you guys get them, we're a lot better than we are now. Because I would say, I've sat down with athletes and tried to be like, okay, we have a, uh, we have a rift between the juniors and seniors, what should we do? And they're like, uh, tell them to be friends. And I'm like, oh, gosh, okay, that ain't gonna work. Um, let's get the guys together at Chipotle. And then they'll be like, one of the captains will be like, do you want me to give them a speech? Like, no, just go to Chipotle with your friends. And they're like, okay. And they're like, when we're there, should we then start talking about the issues and stuff? And I'm like, no, okay. It's, we've been doing this for a lot of years as humans where we just get together, eat food, hang out. I just want you to start developing a relationship and get off your phone. That's all I'm asking, right? So, but like, it showed me how far, because I was trying to lead them to the answer and they couldn't get to it. And it, re and it just showed me, and these are pretty high speed young men that I was talking to relatively. So um, one, I think setting aside that intentional time with your leadership group and identifying uh, your top issues as a team prior to the start of the season, because they'll know what's gonna happen. So you say, okay, what are the top five issues? Oh, and th that's a safe, they can use names. So-and-so doesn't work hard. So-and-so is egotistical. We have a rift between our sophomore five and our seniors. And then you go, okay, now what are you guys gonna do about it? And helping guide them through what that looks like and tangible, actionable, specific ways that they can make an impact. John, you're gonna be in charge of getting that sophomore five over team gathering. Sally, you're gonna, you're gonna, plan, uh, you're gonna plan a time to sit down with the entire team because we're gonna have a little aha moment and we're going to talk about new rules that you believe like how nice is that when your captains actually say we want to be held accountable here and you go okay now i got some juice and energy for that let's bring everyone together and you tell the team what we're doing now if you're one minute late for practice you're sitting in the next game five is that what you guys want to do okay now let's implement it so kind of giving them a little bit of ownership right uh, and the more you do that i think the better i think as coaches a lot of times this is for all sports we get into the x's and o's and I think probably the way that you get the most wins is by just devoting a little bit of time to something like that. What are the issues? And then guiding them through that and doing that like twice throughout the year, I think is huge. Probably like short term, the, the fastest answer I have. Yeah. Yes, so uh, 20, let's say 20 yards, and I would say about eight reps total, and I would say probably about 45 seconds to a minute. What I generally do, just personally, is you can just kind of look at them, and if they start talking, or like they're, you know, they're, you know, you can kind of look at them, you go, okay, you look fine, let's sprint again. Because some kids will be able to go every 30 seconds, and then some will be over there like, you know, kind of doing this, and you just, you give, once they kind of relax, you're like, okay, you good, let's go. Um, so that's roughly somewhere between 30 to 60 seconds. 45 is probably a good in between to make sure that they're fully prepared and ready for a hard sprint again. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.